Greetings, my friends. I'm Bryn Adams. And before we get started with this new episode of this new podcast, I wanted to say a couple of words really quickly and just let you know a couple of things. Number one, this show was recorded roughly a week after the last episode of Outlaw Gamer Radio. And there's references in the show to the time frame it was recorded in. And that's kind of important to, to understand, at least you know from where we were coming from when the, uh, the show was put down. But once we got finished recording, we realized that we needed to find music to put into the show and we needed to prepare some artwork and just all those kinds of things that you have to do when you're launching a new podcast. And so that took a little bit of time to do. So anyway, that's why you're getting the show uh, a little bit later than we normally would have intended. And then the other thing is just that we wanted to let you know that what you're listening to is a good template moving forward for what we want to do with this new show. It's a more of an open format, so it can be more flexible depending on the kind of show that we want to do, whether that's an episode about playing games, which is what this show is about, or if it's going to be more of a product review show or an interview show, this will allow us to do all kinds of different things with, with this particular podcast moving forward whenever we, uh, whenever we do release episodes. So anyway... That's it for now. I just wanted to say thank you very much for listening and for sticking with us and all the support and everything we've seen on the website. We hope you enjoy episode one of Outlaws to the End. That didn't last long. <laughs> Short, uh, shortest retirement ever. That's right. <laughs> Michael that's Jordan right. ain't got shit on us. Uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, here we are. Here we are, Brent, one week later. Coming out of retirement. This is really the I I, I don't this is probably gonna piss listeners off more than they're gonna be glad we're doing it. Uh, probably true. Probably true. You know, because everybody, you know, is having that closure and that catharsis and you know, we saw we saw all those uh, all those nice notes on on the first Silent Tuesday, uh, which which happened this week. Basically, we're not trying to we're not trying to tease you unnecessarily, but we told you guys when Outlaw Gamer Radio ended as a weekly podcast that we were going to do shows when we felt like doing shows when we felt like we had something to talk about. And guess what? We got something to talk about. We got well. It turns s- out several somethings. Turns out, Brent, that I have forgotten how to play a video game without discussing it with four thousand of my closest friends. <laughs> it's not the same. It's not the same, is it? It, it isn't. Uh, I literally started playing Rise of the Tomb Raider, and uh, a couple about an hour, hour and a half into it, I was like, "Oh, I can't wait to talk about this on the." Oh, I don't have a show anymore. Oh yeah, that's right. Except we do. So, um, yeah, it's not Outlaw Gamer Radio, uh, but uh, this is uh, this is going to be the format that we're going to be using going forward, which is to say it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's an open format. Which is to say. say that there is no format. There's not so much of a format. Uh, it's, today it's, we're talking about a few games. Next time it could be talking about Zeely. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, we might do like a roundtable at some point on like this, uh, this Vive uh, developer's showcase that or, uh, uh, was all the or this week. fuck ma- the magic leap dude just got 750 million dollars in funding this is the wow like they're calling it mixed reality light uh oh, what was it called mixed reality light something uh and it's basically it's like you, replaces- you realize we're doing a new section now you know that uh, right? no 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 no, <laughs> no i'm done uh, i just saw this today though it was very exciting uh, it's the one that like beams the image into your retina, and it looks like augmented reality on acid. Yeah, I, I'm, I remember the I remember the device. I remember yeah. the technology. It uses re- <laughs> it uses reflected laser. Uh, I'm laughing because you're right. We, we're we doing said, a new section. We are. It's not. We really. We gotta okay. stop. We gotta yes. stop. But which is to say, again, no format. But uh, yeah, Brent. I, I call Brent up. Um, you know, we recorded the show last Monday. We put it up on Tuesday. Uh, uh, Thursday, which is the weirdest day, uh, Tomb Raider came out. Yeah, 
uh, and the witness was already out from last week. And yep. and Friday the uh, division beta happened. And I played Tomb Raider uh, for just a, a little bit on Thursday and Friday. And I called Brent almost immediately and said, "Hey man, I want to talk about Tomb Raider. Yeah, how's the witness? You want to talk about that?" And Brent was yeah. like, "Sure, I want to talk about that." And then we said, "Well, let's see how the division goes this weekend, and maybe we'll talk about these three games." And so, um, as promised, here we are. If you didn't believe us, it's true. We are going to make shows, as Brent said, when we feel like we have something to talk about so here you go uh one week later all right well let's uh let's so those go, are the games we're talking about let's go ahead and dive into this in case you're wondering what this show is going to be what do you want to start with uh we're, we're going to close with the division we're going to hold off on that we're going to close with that yep uh do you want to start with uh, the witness or rise of the tomb raider let's start with the witness what do you want to know so we're going to i'm going to interview you brent you have played the witness yeah. i have not okay uh you have been streaming the witness i have by the way, for those of you who didn't notice, and by the way, thank you, Brent, yeah. for uh, doing a little work on the website and putting up, Brent put up uh, just below the show spinner, um, uh, Twitch feeds from all the, anybody that posted in that Brent's got a little Twitch feed thing, are you on Twitch? And we've got all sort of Outlaw Gamers Twitch feeds now on the front of the website, which is pretty dope. I didn't even know you were going to do that, and I'm, that's awesome. I didn't either until I'd done it. And uh, yeah, it, it is cool. And uh, just, you know, if you've got a Twitch stream, just, you know, like I've got a, I've got a blog post under the announcements section on the front page yep. and you can just uh, leave me your twitch id there i'll add it to the i'll add it to the list and anytime you go live all the outlaws will be able to see it there's also a twitch directory on the site if you go uh up to the top menu bar in community and go down to twitch streamers you can see a, a dedicated page that has not only that twitch showcase widget but also a complete list of uh of all the outlaws who are on twitch and so anyway it's a great great way to uh to watch awesome games played by awesome people from an awesome community on an awesome website <laughs> yes, known as dope. the Outlaw so, Gamer Society. You have been, Brent is Viking Brent, by the way, on Twitch, and I am actually J.D. Halliday. So jealous. Uh, if, so if you're jealous. looking, I, try, I tried to get that almost everywhere else, and I haven't been able to, but I did manage to, to get it on Twitch. So, um, so uh, uh, yeah, Brent, you've been streaming The Witness. Yeah. Right, so I've watched a little bit of it. I don't have it. You got it on? Did you get it on PC? Yeah, I was just reading today that the game has done pretty well. Like it, it sold. Uh, I think it's like already sold like twice as much as Braid, and uh, I don't know if that was like you know Braid's entire lifespan or like first week or whatever. But right. they're already doing quite a bit better than Braid, according to uh, the article I read. And that uh, obviously having that infusion of money is going to allow them to to look into other platforms. I think they may have already announced an iOS version. Which I think is awesome. I think this would actually be a really good mobile game. Jonathan Blow has also said that he's extremely interested and has already done some work on doing it in VR as well. I can I can get excited about that. I mean, it, it's a game that because it's got such a minimal, there's no interface at all, and the actual interaction is just movement and then kind of like you know the cursor. And so it's like one of those things that like it's it's a game that could really be good early on in VR before you have motion controls and things like that sort of figured out it, it could be really good in vr right now without right. some of that other stuff in place yeah so uh all right so you streamed it i've been watching it thank you for streaming it by the way yeah i've been streaming people, it huh? i guess for three or four days now yeah uh so i have seen from you mm -hmm. uh i started watching in the in the very early portion of it yeah um or, or i think it was you it might have been another user that i watched where where uh you're sort of doing, learning the mechanics. Actually, I think it might have been the giant bomb one, where you're learning the mechanics, and you like you have to open the gate, and there's those cables across the courtyard. It's very early on in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, I kind of watched that, and I thought, okay, so this whole game is puzzles, right? Like the whole game is puzzles. The whole game is puzzles. Different, and I thought different kinds of puzzles. I thought, okay, this, and they're all like this dot. It's not like solving physics-based puzzles or whatever. They're kind of all of this like dot maze type puzzle, right? Is that right? Um, with with one with one exception, which uh, which is my my arch nemesis, my white whale is uh, is the goddamn windmill. Is it the windmill? So wait, so that hold <laughs> so, on, so, so, so hold on a second. But my point so, is, the windmill is a puzzle that is not what you're describing. Like you know, like basically like drawing a path through some sort of grid maze. Well, but wait, wait, hold on. But it is, isn't it? Because I so I, I watched this thing and I thought, yeah. all right, it's just drawing a path through whatever, and then. Cut to like two days later. I see you're on live. I, I flip it on to see what you're doing. Yeah. And it's this windmill. It's this windmill. And the windmill looks to me, I don't know if you've solved it yet or not. I have not. The windmill looks to me to be a, essentially the same thing. It's, it's a dot through a, a pathway through a, it, it a maze, but it's a yeah. moving maze that has limitations. 
That's that's right, and and that that's the that's the challenge of the windmill puzzle so far is that I kind of have a sense of what I'm trying to do. Like you're you're essentially trying to start from point A and go to go to point B. All all of the puzzles in 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 a general sense are point A to point B puzzles. Okay, but there are different there are different rules that you have to observe, and depending on things in the puzzle, like as an example, some puzzles have hexagons, like these tiny black hexagons that are in the in the lanes of the uh, of the grid, and you have to intersect all of those all of those um, hexagons. You gotta draw your line through every hexagon between point A and point B. And then another puzzle will be uh, another puzzle will have like these white and black cubes. And those you'll need to you need to draw the the shape Going from point A to point B, you have to draw the shape in such a way that the the white cubes are like on one side of the line, like like let's say like the inside of the shape, and the black cubes are on the outside of the shape. Right. So each puzzle might have different sort of rules to it. Yeah, it does. And so and that's the real challenge. The, the challenge is understanding what the puzzle, like you know, what new piece of sort of like logic or or what new rule or mechanic. The puzzle is asking you to observe while you're solving it. Okay, so let me ask you some questions. Good. First, I, I want to bury the lead, and I want to ask you if you like this game. I do like the game. I find it very compelling. Uh, in the same way that, that a lot of puzzle games get me, that like Ether One got me, it's one of those things that I'll play the game, and I'll be think you know I'm like I'm thinking about that windmill puzzle like right now, and thinking like what what if I tried this or you know what if I did that, and uh, I, so I do like it. I find it very very compelling. And it's very challenging and very rewarding as a result of that. So you can hold on. So okay. So you compared it to Ether One first of all, yeah, uh, which I consider to be like a super emotional game. Uh, That's in, very true. Yeah, in the context of the narrative, you know, you, you're not making a comparison in that respect. No, are you? I, I'm simply okay. making a comparison on the basis that uh, they are both games that have puzzles that I find myself thinking about well after I've. I've you know shut off the game for right. you know and hours later I'll be thinking yeah what if I tried this or what if I did that and you know right right okay so thing. so um, did you I, I'm curious to know because one of my so one of my concerns with the game so the price is forty bucks right yep, yep. Uh, right now on PC mm-hmm. uh, and one of my concerns with the game is not um, necessarily the amount of hours or playtime you get out of it and we'll talk about that I'm sure right um, but how it's centered around a single mechanic essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, which th- boils we should down say, to connect the dots, right? And we should say that the game is very well reviewed and has been well received. Mm-hmm. Um, so my my question, so one of my other questions here as a follow up to do you like the game is is did you did you like the game from the get go? Is it one of those games that took a while to get into, or did, did it did it hit its stride, whatever that stride is? And, and I want you to elaborate on that too. Is it is it addiction? Is it is it is it the uh, puzzles are intriguing, that sort of thing? But did it hit its stride early in the game, or did it take an hour and a half for you to really sort of get into it? I think it, it happened pretty early. I think I think the moment that the game really kind of got me is early on, and and this this is on the, this is on the Twitch uh, the Twitch stream from day one. But uh, you play through that initial area. It's kind of like a small, you know, kind of like castle courtyard sort right. of structure. Yep. You play through that, and you have to basically solve enough puzzles to open the door and get out. Right, and then you're you're kind of released into the larger world, and you come upon you come upon very early uh, a couple of tutorial stations, I call them, but it, it's a it's it's a group of you know maybe like five six screens that are you know all attached together, and you start at one end, and it's it it shows you basically how this new mechanic works, like as, as an example, like using the hexagons and having to like draw the line through the hexagons, uh, you know, from the start to the finish. Mm-hmm. And like you do that one and then it unlocks the next one and it, and it ramps up in difficulty and shows you different variations and just basically trains you how to, how to use that mechanic. And there's a couple of those tutorial stations that you get into very early. And then the next area, like the, like the first sort of area where it's not holding your hand quite as much, or at least not in an obvious way. You come to this uh, open space that has all these uh, that has all these these trees, and there are stations, you know, like like puzzle stations, sort of spread throughout. And you go to the puzzle station, and it's not a grid; 
it's like this, you know, bizarre like menorah kind of shape. Like, you know, it looks like some like very elaborate candelabra kind of thing. Shout out to my peeps. And I'm sitting there looking at it, and yeah, because like everything you've been doing so far is grids, and now, blam! Here's something that's not a grid. And so you're instantly kind of hit with this uh, this unexpected thing. And I'm looking at it, and I'm and like, you know, it starts with like one, you know, like one sort of uh, path, and then it branches, and then each of those branch, and then each of those branch, and and I'm looking at it, and I'm looking around, and I'm kind of like, huh, looks a little like a tree, and there's trees around here, and then like I look up in this tree that's right above it, and I can see there's like a like a large piece of fruit, like a big apple or something like that in the tree. And I'm like, okay, so if I follow the trunk of the tree and I go up and then I go left, and then at the next split I go right, and then at the next split I go left, and the next I go right, and then I'm at the apple. And so I go to the grid, or you know, I go to the the the, the console, the puzzle console, and I follow that path, you know, that I just sort of visually mapped out on the tree right. and I solve the puzzle. That's the moment where the game got me. That that moment where <laughs> that moment where you know you observe the environment like the game is giving you a clue and you correctly interpret it. I was like, this is cool. Like this is really really cool. And and that's the thing. I mean, it's not it's not heavy handed. The game is kind of telling you, hey, you know, be observant and and th- and then you'll be able to solve this. Uh, so it's relatively easy by comparison to some of the later stuff. But that was the that was the the juice right there. Have you run into any puzzles yet without spoiling anything? And so if it ends up being a spoiler, don't tell me. Have you run into any puzzles yet that have an audio component to them in yeah. terms of indicating yeah. maybe how to solve the puzzle? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I have encountered something that was actually a really kind of profound moment in the game. You you do this one puzzle, and it kind of triggers uh it triggers a it triggers like a video clip to play. And the subject matter and... Do you get rickrolled in this game? No. Oh. Uh, but it triggers a video clip, and the subject matter, like the person speaking, and like like where the video clip comes... Like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a television show. It's a television show that some people may be familiar with. And it's something that I hadn't seen or thought about in a very, very long time. But what the, what the person in the clip is saying may be significant to solving other puzzles i don't know yet <laughs> that's interesting so yeah. all right so let's back up for a second so uh y- you solve the sort of open courtyard pu- for the first puzzles which are in the courtyard you get the gate open yep. and then my, my understanding is the game is is something of an open world that's true yes it, you, it, it's an island it's a it's a large it's a large island and you can go anywhere on the island and so do, you don't have to solve the puzzles in a specific order that's true you don't have to solve the puzzles in a specific order however there are there are certain areas that are behind gates and doors and things like that, like much like in the courtyard, where you're going to have to solve a puzzle in order to get on the other side of it. And right. if you don't, if you haven't gone through like a tutorial uh, process for that kind of puzzle, like it introduces some new mechanic you're unfamiliar with, then it's going to be it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I got you. And how long have you been playing the windmill, as an example? Uh, I have probably played the windmill a grand total of an hour. I would say. Uh, bet- between my stream yesterday and the stream today, I think I've I've had, uh, and the, the, you know the pro- the problem with the windmill is is that it's a, it's a moving puzzle as you say the blades spin very very slowly so the amount of time it takes to try it fail and start over is, is right a, it, it's a little frustrating actually I I would say that when I stopped playing yesterday like, like the day that Esteban was uh, was on there just breaking my balls mercilessly <laughs> as I'm trying to solve this puzzle. <laughs> Uh, but the day that I actually stopped on the windmill, the day that I said, okay, I'm going to have to stop now, and I left it on the windmill, I was, that was actually the angriest I've been at a video game in a long time. I was really fucking frustrated. So, and really quickly, I do want to say that if you're listening to this podcast, please, please do not go to the comments section and, and post solutions to this puzzle or to any of the puzzles in this game that will ruin it for other people. Um, I assume, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I assume, Brent, you've resisted the urge to go to the internet uh, and look for solutions which is which are of course out there yes and no i mean i i have not gone and looked at a guide for anything but having said that because i'm playing the game exclusively on twitch i i mean i haven't i have not played the game outside of streaming it on twitch and no. as a result i have the benefit of of our audience watching me and, in and some, offering suggestions yeah exactly and in some cases 
uh, you know, in some cases, it's people who have played the game and said, okay, you know, here's what you need to be doing with this puzzle. You need to be thinking about this. And, and in some cases, it's just people who are observing and saying, hey, I, like, I think if you did this, uh, you, you know, maybe, maybe that would work. Try that, right. Sure. Yeah, and so uh, it, it, it's, it's ranged from somebody just giving me like a keyword kind of hint all the way to, okay, go up to, go over one, down to, over one, you know, like giving right, me directions right. through right. the grid. I mean, like that's sort of the range of, of help that I've gotten. But there's definitely puzzles I've gotten uh, only because I've had help. There's definitely so, puzzles that the audience has solved for me. So it being an open world, have you, at any point during this puzzle or another puzzle, have you said, um, you know you know what, I've been working on the windmill for an hour, maybe I should just go somewhere else in the world and come, and maybe I'll find something mm-hmm. that will give me a clue as to what to do with the windmill? Yeah, totally, totally. I, I've, I've done that a number of times. When I started playing today, actually, uh, the day we're recording this, I had, at that point, I had kind of three puzzles outstanding. Like, there were three puzzles that I had started and not really been able to figure out. And uh, one of them, I actually made a little bit of headway with, although I don't, even now, I don't really understand why. Like, like it was this puzzle that I really just got through trial and error. And there was a listener, uh, and I don't remember who his name is on OGR. Like, he goes by Drool on, um, on Twitch, but I can't remember what he said his name was on Outlaw Gamers. I'm sure he'll comment if he's listening. But anyway, uh, assuming it's a him, the point is that he was really he was really uh, a big part of today's Twitch stream, and he was kind of telling me, okay, look, you know, like so it's sort of asking you to do this and asking you to do this, and some of these concepts are really abstract, and it wasn't quite clicking with me, and so you know, like I was just going through this trial and error process of you know trying the puzzle, failing, and getting a little bit of feedback on maybe why it was failing, and eventually I got a path that unlocked the puzzle, but I still don't understand the mechanics of why it unlocked with that path and not a different path. Right. You know, so there's been, there's been a couple of cases like that where having the audience help me out has helped me get through the puzzle, but hasn't really helped in the sense of understanding things better. And today's play session left off with, there's this whole, there's this whole type of puzzle that uses these, these kind of Tetris block looking shapes, like inside of the, 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 the squares of the grid, there'll be a little shape that it, you know, it's, it'll be like a vertical line made up of four yellow cubes, or it'll be kind of an L shape made of three yellow cubes, that kind of thing. And like that has actually been like one of the most difficult things to kind of like understand, because what it's asking you to do is it's like asking you to kind of draw a shape in the grid that corresponds to this, this kind of Tetris block shape. And you have to do it in combinations. And so like if there's if there's a, a square made up of four yellow blocks, and then there's a vertical line of say two of these vertical blocks, you have to draw a shape that mimics that. So you know you've got like like four grid grid squares plus two grid squares. And you have to draw that shape in such a way that it it encapsulates both of those icons. And if, if I mean, like I can see you like trying to like understand it where I'm just explaining it to you verbally and like looking at it in the game, it was really challenging. Like, like it is one of those things that like it started off pretty slow and I felt like, okay, I'm getting this, I'm getting this. And then it got much, much harder. And then like, I kind of had this epiphany moment where I was like, Oh, I get it now. Like I get how this is supposed to work. And I really felt like I'd had this eureka moment. And then like two puzzles later, I'm like, I have no idea how this works, you know? And so it, <laughs> it's, it's very, very interesting the way that the game uh, uh, can challenge you with those kinds of things. That, that, that is interesting. I, so I, I'm oh, curious and, to and know. I'm sorry. This is the Go thing ahead. I was going to say, but it's yeah. that particular kind of puzzle. It, it, like we, we were calling it in the stream, mind Tetris. That's what it like. Those kinds of puzzles are mind Tetris. It's, it's like you have to play Tetris in your mind without the ability to rotate the blocks. You know, it, it it was really it was really an interesting uh, just thing that kind of came up during the course of the stream. So I'm curious. So how, how many hours do you think you put into the game on the whole up to this point? Uh, I can check right now. Hang on. Let me let me pull up Steam and I'll tell you. Uh, the answer is twelve. I've played the game for twelve hours according to Steam. Wow. 
12 hours. So what would you say your overriding uh, emotion is having played it? I mean, was, is, is, is there a lot of frustration? Is, uh, actually, let me just, what would you say your overriding like, emotional experience is playing the game? Intrigue. Uh, the, the, the game is intriguing. The puzzles themselves are intriguing. You know, the challenge of them, the, you know, the figuring out the mechanics, um, understanding that the environment plays a factor. Like, there's, there's a whole series of puzzles where the console that the grid is on is transparent, and you can see, you know, the, the, the background of the world behind it. And what you see through the grid is a clue into, sh- into solving it. You know, just like those kinds of aspects are very, very intriguing, but also the larger kind of question of, what is this place? What is this island? And, you know, what are these puzzles doing here? What's the purpose of it? And you come across these, you come across these people, these statues of people. And, it, you know, like, is it a statue? Or is this a person that's, like, been turned to stone in some sort of, uh, you know, Greek mythology uh, fashion or something like that? Uh, so there, there's just a lot of intrigue. And, and like I said, like, this, this, this clip, this, this video clip from this television show, um, it, it, it's a bit like Lost, the, the television series, in the sense that it's a mysterious island with all these questions, but also there are things that just kind of come out of nowhere, that, like these left-hand turns where you're like, what in the fuck is that doing here? It feels like there's this weird sort of uh, component of mist uh, in yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. If you, if you play the old mist games, th- definitely there, there's, there's aspects of the game that, that, that will call that to mind. That sounds awesome, man. I have to say, so two things that I didn't expect were were puzzles based on a, essentially a single mechanic. Yes. But manipulated in so many ways that allows you to play for many, many, many hours of sort of intriguing fun. And and then I didn't wasn't I, I didn't read a lot about this game, but I, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't really anticipating the um the sort of like mist like quality to it in the sense of like having to be really observant of what's going on around you, looking for clues that relate to the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it, so, some of it, some of it is just logic. Like some of it is just logic and understanding the, you know, the mechanics that that the puzzle is is asking you to observe. But some of it is looking for clues in the environment and just thinking about thinking about things. It, you know, it's, it's a nice combination. But the thing I, I just wanted to say something about the uh, what you were just referencing with the game mechanic. In a sense, it really is game design one hundred and one. I mean, it's just, it's like playing Super Mario Brothers where. You've got the jump mechanic and you have the run mechanic and the game starts teaching you how to use those instantly. And then there's also blocks and some blocks you can break and some blocks you can, you know, hit and something will come out. And, you know, so like you introduce like those kind of basic mechanics, but then the game just sort of challenges you to use those mechanics in different ways as it progresses and much more challenging ways. And, and in that sense, you know, the witness is no different. It, it, it has a relatively simple mechanic of move, you know, just draw a line from point A to point B. Right. But the mechanics layer on top of each other and become more complex and more challenging the more you play. The difference is that it's a nonlinear experience because you can go to any part of the island. You can very easily, you know, go and attempt a puzzle that you, you, you like, like the first day I probably solved 40 puzzles the first day that I played right. the game on Twitch. And the right. second day I solved maybe three. Right, yeah, yeah, and that's the kind of game it is. That sounds awesome, man. I, I, I look forward to. I don't think I'm going to pick it up right away personally, only because of uh, these other games that we have that are coming that I'm so interested in. I also would be really intrigued personally by uh, a console version of this game because this sounds like a game. You happen to be doing this, but not everybody's going to Twitch stream every play session, right? But it sounds like a game that would is would be really fun to play with somebody else, and I would love to be able to like sit down and, and play this game with my wife and the two of us together trying oh, to solve yes, this. yes. You know, on, on and, and I don't... Be very fun. Know, people don't obviously typically sit around a PC and play a game physically, uh, you know, together on a PC. And so not, I would love to... Not anymore, although that, that was most of my high school years like with like... Well, Doom actually... And, and, uh, <laughs> yes, and Wolfenstein. That's true. You know? Yes, that's, that's actually true. Me too. But uh, <laughs> like, I'd love to play this game with my wife and she's not going to come sit in my office in front yeah. of the, you know, computer and... Uh, but it sounds awesome, man. It sounds absolutely awesome. It, 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 I, I can tell you that this would be a killer party game. Like, if you could play this on a console or, uh, you, or you know, like on a mobile device like an iPad where you can beam it to the screen, uh, something like that, this could be a very, very fun party game because it is, it, 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 
just playing it on the Twitch stream, there is a fun to that kind of community aspect of playing the game in that way and just people right. like shouting out, hey, maybe it's this and maybe it's this and have you thought about this? And that has been a very, very fun experience. That's awesome. All right. What else do you want to say before we move on to Rise of the Tomb Raider? I Anything just, else that I didn't cover that you want to add? The main thing I want to say is fuck you, Esteban. And <laughs> and that windmill that windmill is going down. It's going to taste my wrath. By Grapthar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, I shall be avenged against that goddamn windmill. Uh, but I just I want to thank Esteban and everybody else who's been uh, hanging out in the uh, in the chat room on the Twitch streams and just watching me play. And you know, like that just makes it uh, very very fun. So thanks everybody, and uh, and we'll just keep doing it. So yeah, that's that's my two cents. Nice. All right, the witness. Okay, uh, right. you ready to talk about uh, Tomb Raider? Oh, let's talk about it. Well, th- I got a lot of questions about this, but uh, right. I, I want to try to structure it in such a way that. It actually it, it 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 will actually tend to make sense. Okay. How does the game end? Yes. No. No. Don't answer that question, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I've not I've not finished the game. Don't be a jerk. Um, <laughs> I don't want to ask where the game begins either, because spoilers. Uh, and, and I do want to try to be respectful of spoilers, but uh, yep. you know maybe you can tell me a little bit here and there. Is Tomb Raider is Rise of the Tomb Raider an open world game? Um, Rise of the Tomb Raider opens up on an island. Uh-huh. With Nathan Drake and Dude. Lara Croft. Dude, making crash babies. The- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is Rise of the Tomb Raider an open world game? Rise of the Tomb Raider is uh, not an open world game in the traditional sense that you would think of like a GTA 5 type of open world game. Right. Um, but it has open world aspects to it. Okay, c- explain that. So, is it is it like the first game where you can you can tr- you can travel as you unlock areas? You can travel openly between areas. Is it like that, or it, it is. is it is it, it beyond is. So, that? It, it it is like that. So they've taken that mechanic and the open world sort of nature of the game and improved on it uh, tremendously, in my opinion. So yes, you can travel back and forth to hubs, uh, to um, base camps. Yeah. Once, for example, once you get the, and this is not a spoiler, this is just like it was in the first one, once you get the arrow with the rope, you know, and you can now go to places where you couldn't before, yeah. uh, you can go back. So that's, you know, so it's got that sort of Metroidvania, whatever, where you're going to go back and go to other places. Um, uh, it, the open world, like the hubs, which existed in the previous game, also exist in this iteration of the game. Mind you, I'm, I'm about six or seven hours into the game. Uh, and I think I'm at like 15% completion of the okay. game or 20%. Um, and again, I'm assuming that 100% completion includes all of the side missions and everything. You know, when I finished Bat- the Batman games, uh, Arkham City and, and games that were sort of more open world, I was probably at 40% when I actually finished the game. Yeah, so you, that does the percentage like about half. Right. So that percentage doesn't necessarily indicate that I'm only 20% of the way through, but yeah. uh, those sort of the, the hub areas, from what I can tell, um, are significantly larger, uh, much, much, much larger. Um, I don't know how many of them there are at this point, um, but uh, yes, you can go back and forth inside of those is, hubs. Is I there a need to? I mean, is there a need to go back and forth? Or yes. Is it, because like, I felt like in the first game, like even though there, w- and I don't think they really build it as an open world, but I felt like in the first game that once you progress beyond an area, there really wasn't much reason to go back other than for, say, maybe like, like trying to get all the collectibles or something like that. Right. And, and that's exactly right. And so they, so I, let me just start off by saying, Brent, I feel like they, I feel like they've improved upon nearly every aspect of this game. Um, and, and we'll talk about that, but you were right. You didn't, I didn't feel a need to ever go back and I never did once in the original game. Um, in this version, uh, the, so people, if you remember, cried out for more tombs. Yes. Uh, there are many more tombs and the tombs are much, much larger and more complicated. What about the puzzles? Uh, uh, within the tombs, you mean? Yes. Yes. They're, they're, they're much more, uh, uh, they take a lot longer to get through and they're more complicated and that sort of thing. And so, a, that sounds great. It is, it's fantastic. And so when you solve a tomb, you unlock uh, permanently and for free uh, one of the skills that is part of this sort of RPG skill tree. Um, and talk, so talk it, about that, because I remember the upgrade paths in the first game, we didn't find all that compelling. No, they're much more compelling in this iteration. So there's three upgrade paths again, which was the same as the first one. There's 
there's brawler hunter and survivor i think and okay. you know brawler's most mostly about um fighting hunter is mostly about um uh some of them are well brawler has a lot of health perks hunter has more weapons type perks and uh survival has more uh crafting and and collecting type perks okay um and each one of them if i rec- i'm just saying this off the top of my head but they have three tiers each and each tier has six or seven uh, skills in it, uh, and each skill requires a skill point to unlock. To and unlock. you rank up for XP, and you get one skill point at a time. Seven hours in, I've probably unlocked five or six skills, and does I it, don't get. Does I don't it, get the sense. Like, remember? Do you remember last time? You really got the sense that you could unlock every skill yes, by the time you got to the exactly end. That's exactly what I was about to ask. Yeah, I, I don't get the sense that's going to be the case this time. I don't know that because so I'm not. You through feel it. like either you're going to have to specialize. Uh, if you want to, if you really want to get to the top, like the top echelon of each of these skill trees, you're going to have to specialize because you're not going to be able to fill in 100 percent of all three. I, I I get that sense. I get that sense. Maybe with the possible exception of the fact that every tomb you solve gives you one of those skills for free, and you don't get to choose it. It just gives it to you. I see. Um, and so like I've solved at this point two tombs, uh, and I've gotten two of those skills. So now maybe if you do the go- skills uh, relate to the tombs, like like something about. Like how you solve the tomb or the puzzles or anything? Like, is there any? No, I don't think so. I no, I don't think so. Is it random? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Actually, I'm not sure. I haven't run into a scenario yet. You know, the one thing that would indicate to me that it's not random, or at least it's not uh, rotational, yeah. is if I solved the tomb and it, it tried to give me a perk that I already had. Gotcha. Right. So, but I haven't looked up any information on that. that so I don't that know. That would be a ripoff. Uh, if you mean if I didn't get it. No, exactly. It's like, oh, well, we were going to give you this, but you've already unlocked it, so fuck you. Screw you. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, yes, there, there, is, there is reason to go back. I already have discovered in a couple previous base camps areas that require the, the, you know, the arrow with the rope to get into them, and I just got it, and I want to go back now and get those perks. Right. Because uh, I could use those free perks. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, additionally, you know, relative to the open world thing, I don't remember this from the last game. Maybe it was there. Maybe I, I don't know. But um, in the big open hub world that I am in right now, there are actually side missions uh, that are given to you by uh, NPCs. Is this like people you're interacting with? Is this people like on the radio? No, it's people you have to go like you go, you know, it'll be on your map. You might trip over it when you're running around or whatever, but there's like a dude and he's from the faction right. or whatever. And you walk up to him and he will give you a side mission and you can either accept it or not. And the two that I've done so far, one of them was go clear out that cave of wolves so we can set up our base camp in there. Uh, and one of them was um, essentially shut down these five transmission stations that are spread way out around this open hub area and require uh, some puzzle solving and platforming to get to them uh, and can be a little challenging. Do, so you, there's, do you find, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm backtracking yeah, a little bit, but... Do you find that the uh, the skill specializations that you were talking about just a second ago, do those actually do those do those facilitate a particular style of gameplay? Like if if you are if you were like sp- specializing like in brawler, does that really kind of dictate like how you play the game, or, or or does it at least you know kind of enhance a particular gameplay style? Or I mean, like, is it going to be like, oh, you know, I'm the kind of player that plays this game with a sawed-off shotgun, no matter which of these specializations I'm ranking up? Uh, a little bit of both. They seem to be a mix and match. I mean, I always, first and foremost, almost always go for the perk that gives you XP boost. Yeah. Uh, because that's what unlocks your other perks. Uh, frequently, I will go for a more health or more um, uh, less damage type of boost early on as well. Right. Um, some of them, you know, the survivor ones, the one that give you gives you more, uh, you get more ammo, you know, from dead people, or it's easier to find resources. Um, you know, those those sort of don't necessarily precipitate a certain kind of play. So if the one, you know, it makes it easier to find resources, I don't have to use my Tomb Raider vision as much or. Uh, my map as much, but the reality is, is even with using the map and the Tomb Raider vision, I'm searching for everything uh, anyway. So, um, so some of them do, but but not as much maybe as as I think I would like to see them. Uh, you know, the 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 give you an example, the hunter one. Uh, I just unlocked a perk that allows me to shoot two people with uh, two two arrows simultaneously. Okay, uh, that certainly. Um, 
uh, moves me towards using the bow and arrow, right? Uh, which can be uh, a little bit towards you know being more stealthy, uh, hence the hunter, as opposed to being a brawler, which gives me um, the ability to craft explosives on the run more quickly and easily. Mm-hmm. So yeah, okay. it does. Some of them do, some of them don't. How's the story? Phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, I am absolutely loving the story. The acting is is top notch. Uh, the I can't remember the name of the woman who plays uh, Laura, but uh, uh, she she is phenomenal. Uh, the acting is just fantastic. The dialogue is really good. The story is a very sort of uh, it's a typical adventure story. Uh, intertwined with uh, Lara's story about her relationship with her father, right? Um, and it's it's fantastic. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, how much how much of this story feels like a logical continuation of the first game? It feels like a perfectly logical continuation, actually, in the context of you know, in the first game, Lara was just discovering herself as a Tomb Raider, mm-hmm. and I it, it, with a bit of a suspension of disbelief, right? So I didn't overanalyze. Uh, in the first game that Lara... And I didn't... By the way, I didn't love the first game. I liked it. Right. I didn't love it. Um, I thought it had a lot of potential, but it was somewhat repetitive and 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 uh, really could have been flushed out a little bit more in terms of gameplay mechanics. So just to just to give a little background. Um, but I didn't sit around and question the fact in the first game that, that while Lara was supposed to just be, you know, learning about being a Tomb Raider, she managed to kill a lot of people throughout the game. You know, given how much it upset her at the beginning, like I didn't overthink that. Right. Um, in that con, you know, with that sort of same similar suspension of disbelief, uh, this is a, a logical next step. She is now um, coming into her own, but she's still uh, there's still a sort of a tie to the origin story uh, that we're working on here. It's not 15 years later when she's just a Tomb Raider and we're not dealing with where'd she come from or how'd she get here. Still on there's that still, path. There's still an origin story feel. But she's more balls out like she was at the end of the last game, and it makes sense. So to, to me, like I would equate this to like the Daniel Craig Bond movies, uh, you know, beginning with Casino Royale. And they said, you know, we're going to tell the story of how, of how James became Bond. And you know, by the time you get to the end of Skyfall, you're like, now he's Bond. Now, after three movies, he's 007. Um, and and I, 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 that's the kind of feeling I'm getting from, from what you're saying about Tomb Raider. Yeah, and I I think it fits in nicely, uh, so, you know, in that in between role between the origin story and the fully realized, you know, Lara Croft of 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 her adulthood. We talked about way back when how we thought that this game needed to be basically Squeenix's answer to Uncharted, and that that would be a very very good beginning point for this series, and I feel like. I feel like they didn't quite achieve that in the first game. I feel like they definitely moved in that direction in regards to the combat and uh, the puzzle solving and the uh, the traversal. How So considering that I think that you and I agree that the first game did not quite do that, like it, it was attempting to do that, but it didn't quite succeed as well as it might have, how does this game feel? Does this game feel like it's... It's it's succeeding, or does it feel like it's starting to kind of go off in a different direction? That's all its own now. No, I feel like it's it's succeeding uh, in a big way. I feel like they listened to the fan base really mm-hmm. and addressed the biggest concerns of the fan base, um, and, and have really improved upon it. And to the point that I'll be honest with you, I said to my wife, I I'm worried about Uncharted Four at this point because I feel like Tomb Raider has set the bar so high that Uncharted 4 may not be able to meet it. Uh, I feel like... That's blasphemy. I know, right? I feel like of all the Uncharted games I've played... Um, now, we've seen a lot of cool shit about Uncharted 4, so I, I, I'm a, I reserve judgment. But yeah. uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, compared to the other three Uncharted games in the previous Tomb Raider, uh, is by far the best mechanics in the game. Uh, it is also stunningly beautiful uh, in, in character animation, in... Um, visual art style in uh, environments. I mean, it's unbelievably beautiful. And so you put those two things together and uh, it is mechanically uh, uh, really, really incredible. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, they have, I have yet to see a quick time event. I was, was, was going was to ask about that. Yes. Th- which was one of the, you know, the complaints from the early, uh, early game, maybe a little too uh, many uh, quick time events. I've yet to see a quick time event, which with the one exception of, I suppose you could 
call it a quick time event when you leap to, and I love this mechanic too, when you leap uh, onto like say an ice face of a rock mm-hmm. and you uh, plunge your ice axe into it. Right. If you don't get both hands into the ice, you'll flail one arm back and you have to hit the E key uh, to, to regrip. Right. The, um, uh, but other than that, I have yet to see, a, 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 if you call that a quick time, but I've yet to see a quick time yeah. event in the sense that we saw them before. Where you're um, sliding down the side of a mountain and you've got to dodge left and then you've got to jump and dodge right. and Correct, or, or with the bear or whatever. Right. I have not seen that yet. Um, the traversal uh, feels as good as ever, and I love the mechanics of the ice axes and using them to climb the ice or rock faces. Yeah, I thought um, that was a great. I mean, that was that was a cool part of the first game is you having like that uh, that scaling tool. That was uh, that was a very very cool mechanic in the first game, and it that- works works and looks beautifully uh, in this game as well. Um, and then the combat mechanics they have improved upon vastly. I I, I I feel like whenever I get into a situation, it's it's I and I genuinely feel like this. I'm not trying to back of the box quote here. I feel like when I get into any situation where there's enemies, except when they were trying to teach me how to do mechanics, mm-hmm. that, that I can choose. Do I want to play stealthy or do I want to blow them up? And and if I, whichever direction I go, if I choose to play stealthy, I can sneak up behind them in a way that works and is easy. I don't. I have yet to find myself getting caught by the AI because I accidentally stepped on something that I shouldn't have or whatever. Right. Um, uh, so I can sneak up behind them, take them out from behind. I can be stealthy by uh, taking them out at a distance with an arrow to the head, as long as they're not in sight of anybody else. Uh, or I can be stealthy by you know standing on a tree branch, waiting for them to walk underneath me and pouncing and landing on top of them. Um, I can throw a bottle in the distance, uh, and if there's two guys talking to each other, the one furthest away will go chase that bottle, and then I can sneak up behind the closer guy, take him out, and then make my way around to the second guy. So there's options with stealth. If I decide to go balls out, I can do that by pulling out a machine gun if I have one. I could do that by blowing up your, you know, the required, the requisite red barrel. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a, a uh, yeah. there's also a very cool on the fly crafting mechanic which I've not seen before. Where you could, for I just discovered my first one of these. I you, I pick up a tin can, and if I have a certain resource on the fly, I can turn that tin can into a shrapnel grenade. Nice and throw it. I can't make them and collect them, uh, but if there happens to be a tin can lying around, I can turn that on the fly into a grenade. Interesting. Um, and so again, I've, it's only the tip of the iceberg. I know there's many more versions of that kind of thing with gas cans and other things right. uh, that you can craft on the fly. Uh, some of which, again, there's... And then there's environmental stuff, like there's... If you see a lantern, uh, a, a, a gas lantern, you can throw it and it kind of... It can let, light someone on fire if you hit them with it, or if you throw it into a fire barrel, it will Ooh. you know do, just fire everywhere. Um, things burn down. You can pull down structures. Um, so there's a lot of variety in the combat, and you can have hand-to-hand combat, there's a lot of variety in the combat, and you really can't choose if you want to be stealthy or not. And it's it's uh it, it's it's really really well done. It's it, it sounds like there there's a certain amount of kind kind of like with uh, with Metal Gear Solid Five. It sounds like there's a certain sandbox quality to the game where it, it's it's giving you resources, equipment, tools, and and just kind of turning you loose on the problem and and letting you attack it in whatever way you you see fit. Yeah, for the most part, that's true. I mean, there certainly are areas where they make it turn into a firefight. Yeah, um, and, and I and and they do that so you can learn how to you know fight with a gun and then make your decision as to whether or not going forward that's what you want to do. But yes, essentially, you get into the areas where there are the enemies, and it's up to you to figure out to decide if you want to puzzle solve it and be stealthy, or if you just want to go in and blow some shit up. And both are equally fun. And so, I, what I find is, I tend to lean towards the stealth. But I find sometimes I just want to blow shit up, so I go back and forth. They're both they both feel satisfying and interesting. Yeah. And there's enough variability. You know, again, if I want to be a guy who just crafts shit all the time and blows them up, um, I can do that. Well, man, I got to tell you that uh, you know that that's taken the game from I don't know, like I was kind of in a wait and see mood on it, but uh, it's definitely piqued my interest. And and it sounds like it, it. I guess it's running pretty good on PC at this point. It's running fantastically. I'm running at just under sixty frames per second uh, on old. Ult- high i think or very high yeah um on my 970 um it looks phenomenal the pc port is fantastic i've had zero literally zero technical issues uh to this point 
Um, and and I, I find myself like thinking about the game when I'm on my way home and I can't wait to play it. It feels like a true... I feel like we lack right now in um, uh, literature, hint, hint about writing, <laughs> um, <laughs> movies, television. I feel like we lack that sort of old school adventure. Uh, we have a lot of action movies uh, and action stories, but I feel like we're lacking in some real sort of old school adventure. And I feel like this is a true old school adventure and a very, very well done one at that, at least at this point in the game. And fuck, man, I'm, lo- I'm loving it. I mean, I literally, I mean, I called you and said, I want to do a show because I am enjoying it so much. And I'm so pleasantly surprised at how they have literally have taken everything from the first game and improved upon it in a way that, that I think makes this a, a fantastic game. Well, I uh, I'm delighted to hear it. that's that's definitely put it onto my watch list where it it, it might not have been before. So, do you want to talk about uh, you want to talk about the division, the closed beta, a little bit? We we played it this past weekend together. Uh, I I played it a little bit more than you, but yep. we got to, we got some seat time with it, and I, I I think it's a pretty I think it's a pretty polarizing experience. Uh, it seems like you know, some people have been pretty uh, pretty happy with it. Some people have had fun, and other people have really been turned off by it. And then, of course, there's sort of the shadow of Ubisoft hanging over the whole affair, and you know, like what the final game is going to be. Are they going to be able to address the cheating situation? That was sort of a problem on, I think, more so on the PC, but maybe a little bit on the console side. What was the deal with the cheating situation? I just saw something about that. Well, from what I've read, and I didn't experience this, but from what I've read, apparently, th- there were some exploits that uh, the people had figured out. How to uh, how to you know basically become invisible and invincible uh, with within the game and uh, and then I think also maybe like there was some some way that they were they were exploiting some glitches or something like that to get uh, you know like uh, infinite ammo or something like that. Okay, but I, I, um, yeah. in any case, um, how how much did you play? Did you just play that one that one afternoon that you and I played for about an hour and a half? How much did you play? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, I played for about 30 minutes the morning it came out, uh, and then I played with you, uh, and I played maybe another 30 minutes uh, alone outside of that. What, uh, what, what's, what's, the, what's the Twitter length takeaway for you? Um, I think the Twitter length takeaway is probably that it's not a, 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 an early purchase for me. Um, my, my biggest gripes were... Um, I, this is going to sound petty, man, but uh, I don't want to say it's graphics, but but sense of presence in the environment. I think the graphical downgrade for me uh, mostly took away t- for me the sense of feeling like I was in New York, and that was a big draw for me. I didn't feel like I was in New York. I felt like I was in some generic, uh, you know, almost like home front or whatever, just what the action game X urban setting. Okay. It did not feel like New York City to me the way it did in the previous uh, versions, and that was that that bothered me. I don't know why, but it bothered me quite a bit. Do you, um, do you think that that was down to the the area of New York that you had available to you in the beta? Do you think if you were like you know seeing some more recognizable landmarks uh, that that would uh, that would be different? So I I take the train into Penn Station probably uh, at least. Uh, four or five times a year, if not more than that. Penn Station is is located under Madison Square Garden. Yep. So that corner uh, on 33rd and 7th uh, is uh, very, very familiar to me. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't think there is a more recognizable place in New York City for me right. than what was shown in the beta. Um, so, no, I, I don't think... I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Um, but I, I think the graphical downgrade and the... La- the the um, less dense, pop, less densely uh, rendered world, uh, along with some of the graphical downgrade, was a, a, a an issue for me in terms of the, in terms of that sense of presence. So, so that was a big problem for me. I mean, one of the things I was most excited about this game was feeling like I was in New York for real, yeah. And that promise of a one to one rendered Manhattan, which we now know is just Midtown, uh, south of Central Park down to Gramercy Park, which is a big chunk. I mean, that's yeah. thirty plus blocks. Uh, long and and something like twenty blocks or fit or ten ten twelve blocks cross, which is a big chunk of the city, but um, uh, it just didn't have that sense of presence for me. I don't know why. So that was one concern. The other concern, the mechanics, uh, I felt like were fun enough in terms of like the shooting itself, um, 
but the overall sort of sustainability of the game, I got the sense that without you or a group of my friends, it would have been significantly less fun. That's kind of the Twitter length uh, takeaway from me is that I, I think it's I think it's a really fun game with friends. Um, but I I don't know how fun it would be playing solo, as some people have asked about, or with you know just encountering other people in the world. And I mean, it is an it's an MMO. I mean, it really is an MMO, and it's got a lot of the a lot of the qualities that you'd expect from an MMO. So the idea of you know like putting together a party and going and doing stuff that that tracks it makes sense uh but it, it it also is interesting the way that i think it's trying to kind of be both things in a sense uh because certainly outside of the dark zone you can totally play that i mean you can play that by yourself no problem i don't know that it'll be as fun or as compelling uh as as it would be with friends because at that point you're basically playing it and kind of relying on the the in game atmosphere the narrative the characters to sort of carry it along and frankly the characters and the narrative did not come across all that well in the beta for me uh, I think that they were holding a lot back for you know the sake of spoilers and whatnot but I did not find any like really deep narrative stuff uh, in the in the in the closed beta that that you know has got me all excited to see how the game ends or you know whatever well I, I think you're being generous by saying like but by assuming they're holding back, I, I felt like, I mean, certainly they're holding back story points. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I felt like um, the dialogue and the acting and, and the characterizations they presented yeah. were, were just like, like, again, like, you know, kind of generic sh- shooter game one oh one, Right. Yeah. And it just yeah, like, generic. It, it didn't feel like it had any identity, any identity to me, man. I mean, I, th- I felt like the reason I would play this game is if I'm into those mechanics, that MMO, like I want to, uh, I agree. Yes, it, it's, and, it's more and about the mechanics. And I don't know if it even. And for me, that's not what this game was about to begin with. And I don't know if it even stands up in that regard. I'm not sure. Um, I, I I'm not opposed to multiplayer only games. Obviously, I buy them. I play them. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know, man. It just it didn't feel like it had a had character or identity it felt like it felt very generic to me i had some good experiences with the game but they were all in relation to playing with uh you know with some of the the people in the audience and as as i was remarking on one of the one of the final episodes of uh of outlaw gamer radio uh, you've had a lot more opportunity to play with members of our audience than i have and this weekend was a really great experience for me in the sense that I finally got a chance to uh, you know to, to play to play games with some people, which I don't play multiplayer as often, but uh, it, it was really really fun to just you know to like post to to Twitter, post to the website, hey, I'm playing the division. Anybody want to hop in and join? And uh, you know I, I got to play with Christopher Fatui and um, Randy Marshbeer and Neil. Uh, actually, that 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 day that the four of us were playing together, that was one of the most fun days. Uh, and, and I was streaming the whole thing to Twitch and. Um, and you know, I mean, we just had a riot. We had a really, really fun time, uh, largely due to uh, Neil UK's extreme aversion to rabies. Turns out, <laughs> turns out he really, really doesn't like rabies, and he'll do anything, and I mean anything, to prevent its spread. What um, <laughs> but uh, what a murderer you mean? The point is that um, I had great, great fun with the game in in, in those you, like like within that sort of. Uh, context right but uh, one of the things that i really like about the game is i really do dig the mechanics like you were saying that like you think the mechanics are about the only thing that there is to enjoy but for my own part i really enjoy the mechanics now i'm more of a casual like, are, you shooter about, guy. are you talking about the shooting mechanics yes, or are you talking I'm, about i'm yeah, talking about the right. combat mechanics right third person cover base shooter it is a third person cover base shooter but i also like i dig the fact i dig sort of like the tactical kind of thing that you can do with it and like um when when I first started playing, I think that this was with Christopher Fatui. Uh, he could he could verify. But um, when I first started playing, it was just it was just me and and, and him, and uh, we're doing the Madison Square Garden mission. And you come to that part where you're going to uh, you're going to try to like you know take those guys that have the hostages over in the Kobe's restaurant. And so I'm on like one side of that. Uh, you know, like like that divide. You have to like you know basically like w- go all the way down this like kind of walkway catwalk thing, and then like come through a door. And I'm on one side of the divide, and he is going down, and he's opening the door. 
And then like, you know, they see him, they start firing in him and I've got a perfect flanking position. And so like being able to like, and, and like we, we did that again. Like, like when I played with the, uh, when it was the four of us playing, we played that mission again and kind of recreated that. But like now with like four man, a four man team. And, um, that thing of like tactics, like, like being able to kind of like set up L shaped ambushes and like actually kind of pull them off the way that the way that you can draw fire. I, I'm like, you know, like you can actually say like, okay, I'm going to draw his fire. You go get in a flanking position, but about about but about about, you know, and, and the guy starts shooting back at you while your friend is like, you know, sneaking to get a, uh, to, you know, to, to get a good uh, position on, on the, uh, the guy you're fighting. I love that stuff. I love that stuff. Yeah, and I feel like I never really get that experience on like a first person shooter. Oh, dude, there's so many uh uh ways to to experience that and when the, when there's when people offer a co-op um in a tactical shooter. Um and yeah, no, I mean I, I agree, you know, some people will find it off putting that uh um, you know, the, the AI is bullet sponges and you have to essentially unload an entire clip. It is not realistic. No, no, it, uh, in that, that, that context. Is totally, I mean, it's, it's just like Uncharted 1 in that sense. Yeah, it, and, and which is fine. I mean, you shoot them and the numbers are flying off of them, like in Borderlands. I actually, well, I, I will give them credit. They give you the ability to turn that off, yeah. which, which most games do not. And I turned it off almost immediately, so I didn't see the numbers flying right. uh, with how much XP I was getting or whatever. Um, but, uh, very arcadey in the shooting, but I felt, but it was fun. It was fun and I enjoyed it. It was, you know, I, I, it was well done, but again, that's in the, um, well, th- there's portions of that both in the dark zone and in the regular area. Um, yeah, let's, let's talk about that just a little bit about, about the dark zone and, you know, because like the dark zone is sort of like a, it, I don't know, it's like diet Daisy or something. Yeah, to a degree. I mean, the, the point of the dark zone is. In the dark zone, you is a PvP area, so other players can kill you, which is not the case in the regular area. Right. Um, you go with the the object, and then there's AI in there, and it's high level AI, much higher level than there is on the outside. As as we um, di- and, as we discovered the hard way, we did. Uh, the idea is you go in there, and you're supposed to be looking for higher level loot. Once you get the loot, yeah. you have to extract it via helicopter, or you can lose it if somebody kills you. Yes. Uh, so. Um, you know, there's, it, it, there's a couple of things. So now the, if you go, if you open fire on another player, you're marked as rogue and people on the other real players will see that you have gone rogue yep. and will descend upon you and attack you potentially. So there's a, a, a um, incentive not to go rogue, uh, if that's incentive for you. Um, the big problem with the dark zone, and I really enjoyed our play in the dark zone, Brent, but the entire time you and I played in the dark zone, we were never once attacked by another uh, live human being and one of the biggest complaints about the dark zone is people griefing the extraction areas yeah. um, and just su- essentially large teams of players just camping surrounding yeah. and camping the extraction areas so when people go there they call in the helicopter they wait they wait they wait till the helicopter shows up and the rope drops and the minute that happens they lay waste to everybody steal your gear and extract it themselves yeah um, and uh, I don't see how they're going to prevent that and I think that would uh, uh, that might annoy me to the point of never going into the dark zone. I, I I can understand that, and I mean, you know, like that first day that we played, we didn't encounter a single rogue player. I mean, we we, we saw players, we fought alongside a couple, we had no problems. Was we we extracted a bunch of loot with several other people, we had no problem. I went in and played solo in the dark zone uh, Monday morning, and I was I was really really on edge, and uh, I. I, I encountered a couple of other people who helped me out with. Uh, I got into a. I got into a situation with some AI that wasn't going so well, and uh, I, I got I got an assist from a couple of other anonymous players, and uh, had a couple of skirmishes and stuff. And then at one point, I was. Um, I can't remember what I was doing, but uh, I saw I saw like some rogue players, and so I was I was just kind of sneaking up there, and I thought, ah, you know, maybe I'll just I'll, I'll try and get the drop on them. I'll go out in a blaze of glory or whatever, and. I'm I'm kind of like going up the like the side of this building, you know, there's like the scaffolding. And before I actually get up to the roof where they are, I encounter another player who's uh, you know, who who's his name is in white. I'm like, oh, "Okay, great. You know, so this this maybe this guy's thinking the same thing I am." Well, you know, like I I run over there and like he just unloads on me. And uh, I'm like, "Oh, of course, of course." And you know, like I figure like they're kind of doing it like a, you know, like they've got a dove. Like like they've got one player who is not killing people. 
to like lure in players like me or something like that. But anyway, he took me out, and then I heard him over the public voice thing saying like uh, he says, "Oh hey, I, uh, he's like I got your gear back, uh, you know, like I got a I got an eighty second uh, rogue penalty, but I got your gear back." And so I don't know, maybe they thought it was somebody else that had attacked them earlier or something. I don't know. But anyway, that was that was the last experience I had with it. So. I, I I agree that the dark zone I did not find as compelling as as I maybe thought I would, but um, I like the mechanics overall. And I have to say, like I I dug the I dug the weapon customization. I dug uh, what you could do with that. I dig the base building stuff that was going on. Couldn't really get into the crafting. I mean, there was there was a lot of the game actually that was kind of closed off to you in the beta, right? But I I did I really enjoy those things. I like the weapon customization. I would love to have gotten into the crafting mechanic, and I would love to have been able to do more of the base building stuff, those things would have kept me coming back if I could have done more of them. But basically I just ran out of shit to do in the beta. So, so do you think you're going to get the game? It's very possible. If under the, under the condition that like the reviews come out and the game is not, the game is not fundamentally flawed or like, you know, really different in a terrible way from the, the closed beta, uh, that the, like there are no like major server problems that you know like like it's just you know right. people are not able to play. Obviously, you're going to want to see the wide release of an online only game. Exactly, provided that those things are there, that the game is solid, and that some of the people uh, on the site, you know, people you know people like you know Christopher Fatui or Neil, Randy Marshbeer, Lance, um, pick it up on PC. Yeah, if if, the, if those people are are interested in getting it, we all kind of going to go in together and say. Yeah, I, th- I think I want to get it. Let's pick it up. Yes, under those conditions, I'd get it. But only uh, under those conditions. It's one of those games yeah. that I'm only interested in playing with friends. Yeah, I, I just don't. I don't think this did, did enough for me. I want to see. I, I want to see more from it and see. I, I mean, I need to see the reviews, obviously. But this, yeah. I, I didn't finish the beta. What's weird is I actually there were times when I wasn't playing the game that I kind of wanted to go back and play it, or that I sat down to play it. And I had it in Tomb Raider, and I thought, should I play? Should I play this for a minute? Um, but at the same time, it just it didn't do enough for me to make me want to get the game. And I felt like over time, I, I don't know that it's going to have value. If it's, I just feel like it's going to get sort of grindy. Well, and, and I think that's valid. I mean, certainly, like I was saying, like you could play this game solo. Like you can totally play the game solo if you want to. You could you could play the majority of it as a single player game if you so chose. But I think that it would get grindy fast. I, I think that I think that the way that the game sustains itself, at least the closed beta, it could be different later, but at least the closed beta, I felt like it would it would get old pretty quick if you were playing solo. They are supposed to be doing an open beta. Um, I'm not sure when that's happening. I'll, actually, I'll Google that real fast. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Obviously, between now and March 8th, but I didn't know that. Yeah, let's see. I, I think or I March think, 9th. Or... I think it's in a couple of weeks. Let me just see here. Um. Oh, and I just uninstalled the damn game from my computer. <laughs> I did too, but that's because uh, that's because I got XCOM two on uh, yeah, Friday. Should, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is this is according to the Eurogamer article, and this is dated today, February second. Xbox Italy's official Facebook page has details for an open beta of the division. Ubisoft's online shooter will throw its doors open to the public from the sixteenth to twenty first of February. Oh wow, five days! So there you go. So oh, good. Well, I mean, I'd be willing to get back into it again, check it out, see how it handle, handles the. Um, Me too. Uh, the server load. I mean, I wonder if it will be the same beta. That's what I really uh, want to know. I want to yeah. know if it's different. I want to know if it's the same beta we've played, or if it's you know if, if there's a there's more things that are unlocked in it. Uh, you can see. Yeah, I got. I mean, I got to tell you to convince me to buy it. There's going to have to be something else in there because I definitely I would not download it again just to play the same beta again. Right. Um. So maybe uh, maybe the, what we'll what we'll do is we'll close out here with some poll results. Uh, oh, we got poll results. We got poll results. That's an unexpected pleasure. I asked, uh, <laughs> isn't it, though? Oh, poll results. That's just what you want to hear, the dark of your bedroom. But anyway, I asked uh, I asked you guys in a club poll, having played the beta for Tom Clancy's The Division, I'm planning to... Dot, dot, dot. And I- I'm going to read the results of this because this this poll is kind of a weird one. Um, so there's there's sort of like uh, four choices as far as like what you're planning to do. Um, the, uh, the, the number four choice was 6% of the vote was pre-order the game. The number three choice was 7% of the vote was pick up the game on day one. 
The number two choice with 22% of the vote is skip it. And the number one choice with 28% of the vote was I'm waiting until the reviews to decide. Very prudent. In addition to those questions, I also asked for people who are thinking about picking it up. We asked them to answer a couple of other questions. Uh, one of which is I'm also going to get the season pass. Zero percent. No votes whatsoever uh, are, are getting the <laughs> yes. season pass for this game. For the people who Way are go, interested, outlaws. for the people who are interested in picking this game up, one percent of you will be playing on Xbox One, thirteen percent on PlayStation Four, twenty-two percent on PC. And I tell you, this is something that we I think we ought to do moving forward when we have multiplayer games like this or like you know Battlefront or that kind of thing. We ought to start doing polls like this so that people can see, you know, where the distribution is, like, you know, in the platforms that people are getting it on. You know, it might help people make a decision if they want to get it on PC or on a console or something like that. So anyway, but uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, for participating in that poll. And uh, hopefully that'll help all of us, you know, just have some uh, have some context for, uh, you know, whether or not we want to get the game and and have the ability to play with other people and how likely it is that other people on the site are going to be getting the game that we could potentially play with. Yeah, man, I think it's a great idea. Uh, all right, I wasn't expecting poll results. We just kind of wanted to get on and talk about some games. We just ha- You happened to throw up a poll last week, so that's yep. awesome. It's uh, And I didn't even know we were going to be doing the show when I did it. I know, I didn't know we'd be doing results. So, uh, yes, with that, we will wrap it up. Uh, I think, as we said uh, before, this is, this is what we were talking about. We wanted to do a show. We did a show. I hope you guys enjoy it. I know Brent hopes you guys enjoy it. Uh, we have no idea when the next show will be coming. Uh, might might be two weeks, might be two months, but my guess is it won't be that long because VR is coming sooner than that. Oh my god! Do you know? Um, do you know when you're going to have yours? Uh, I haven't gotten a specific date, but I got in. Uh, mine was April, and I, you know, I mean, I got in. It took me. I was in the first half hour or so, or forty minutes. So I'm guessing right. probably the early part of April, but I don't know that. I don't have a ship date yet. So, so April is two months away. So it it could be two months, is what you're saying? Mm, no, not in my mind. No. Well, I think that we'll be doing another one of these to talk about Firewatch because I'm pretty sure we're both going to be playing Firewatch. Uh, maybe. And XCOM two. Uh, no, we're not both going to be playing XCOM 2. Well, that is your loss, because I am sure as fuck going to be playing <laughs> XCOM 2. Uh, all right, guys. Thanks for listening to the show. Glad we could put out something for you. Um, as usual, of course, uh, and I'm not going to do a rundown of the show the way I usually do, but we very much want to hear your comments. So if you're playing or interested in The Witness or uh, Tomb Raider or uh, The Division, we want to hear what your experiences were. Join the conversation. We love hearing from you guys. We will continue to be present on the website brent is streaming obviously a lot i may poke my uh head out there for some uh streaming uh when i can and and other than that we'll see you next time uh, we got a show for you and don't forget you don't get old because you stop playing no wait a minute don't forget you don't stop playing because you get old you get old because you stop playing i like how you're telling us not to forget you're the one who needs to not forget <laughs> don't forget when you get old you start to forget things that's what happens like you know we went we went eight days instead of seven days and you lost it. That's exactly right. Just gone. Total failure.